We're going to call this meeting to order. Please uh, join us in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Roll call, please. Please note for the record that all board members and authority members are present. Okay, uh, adoption of the agenda. Any uh, deletions, changes? I want to change the Yeah, I um, want to uh, close in memory of the victims in uh, South Florida High School shooting. And then I want to move up the uh, uh, presentation under Mayor Council Matters, the Mayor's Proclamation, uh, declaring February as Black History Month. I want to move that up after adoption of the agenda. I'll so, make that motion. With those two? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We have an agenda. So first up is uh, it's going to be a presentation here. It's uh, in honor of Black History Month 2018. Whereas the city of Brisbane takes pride in joining Americans throughout the country in recognizing February 2018 as Black History Month. And whereas Black History Month pays tribute to the contributions that African Americans have made to American history and their struggles for freedom and equality and deepens our understanding of our shared history. And whereas our diverse culture enriches and broadens the American experience <clears throat> of which black heritage is an inseparable part as it weaves throughout our country's history, profoundly influencing every aspect of our lives. And whereas the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, the founders of Black History Month, selected the theme for 2018 to be African Americans in times of war, to commemorate the centennial of the end of the First World War in 1918, and honors the roles of uh, African Americans, soldiers, sailors, veterans, and civilians in every American war from the Revolutionary War era to that of the present war against terrorism. And whereas we commend the many achievements, successes, and contributions of African Americans in all fields of endeavor, and whereas we call on the members of the public to attend programs, presentations, art exhibits, and movie showings being held to observe Black History Month across San Mateo County, including community events hosted by San Mateo County Libraries, the African American Library Advisory Committee, and the San Mateo County History Museum and the College of San Mateo. Now, therefore, be it resolved that on this 15th day of February 2018, the City of Brisbane does hereby proclaim February 1st through February 28, 2018 as Black History Month, dated this 15th. Thank you, and Ingrid, we'll, we'll send this off to the uh, association. Okay. All right, that brings us to oral communications. We have one slip, and Michael. Michael Barnes, former mayor. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. My name is Michael Barnes, and I'm a Brisbane resident. Since I moved to Brisbane, every city council has disagreed with my position that housing should be part of Bayland's development. I suspect this council is no different, yet here we are, studying housing on the Baylands. While you have rejected or fought my suggestions over the years, in light of events, I hope you might give greater consideration to what I have to say. From recent City of Brisbane communications, it appears that you are adopting some of President Trump's strategy of disparaging the press. Just as President Trump claims that the media is a disgrace and they've called me wrong from the beginning, Brisbane complains that the San Francisco Chronicle is ill-informed and the city is upset with immediate implication that Brisbane is delaying acting on housing for political reasons. You will not win the war of public opinion by complaining about either the press or the opposition. You, you will win by doing your job well. Your job is to design a safe, sustainable, and feasible remediation and development plan for the Baylands. You should focus on your responsible actions, which now include studying Baylands housing. Your opponents and the media will be grateful for your honest change unless you wage a campaign of resentment and blame. With your new approach to housing, you will have the support of a new constituency in Brisbane, one quieter than your friends on city committees and commissions. 
Your new constituency are the good people who included housing in your 2007 community vision process for the Baylands. In 2009, the City Council removed housing from the community plan. It is unfortunate that in January 2014, your ridiculous allies on the Open Space and Ecology Committee claimed that the community pl proposed plan is not characterized correctly since members of the community did not form this plan. Not only did the community form the plan, in October 2015, you received the results of your scientifically valid community survey, which revealed that about half of the community supports Baylands housing. But with this information in hand, your planning commission then refused to study housing as part of the Baylands EIR, preferring instead to reject the opinion of half of Brisbane. I think the legislature, the press, and the community are all giving you a chance to redeem yourselves by studying the fiscal impacts of Baylands housing. I suggest you focus on this rather than addressing wrongs you feel you have suffered from the press or your opponents. My final suggestion tonight is on a different subject, and that is the school bus. Uh, with the demise of the high school bus, I suggest the city distribute the bus money to the public high schools in proportion to the number of Brisbane students attending each high school, including Daly City's Shasta High School. The principal's name is Ava Petrash, and I will provide her information to the city clerk. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> okay, we don't have any other slips or anybody else in the audience, so that comes to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> let me back up a little bit. Uh, city Attorney, do we have anything to report out in closed session? Harry, you're supposed to remind me. <laughs> <laughs> We had two matters on in closed session, one city attorney uh, evaluation of city attorney services and the other concerning uh, anticipated litigation. Uh, no action was taken as a result of either of those matters. Thank you, Michael. Okay, it comes to a consent calendar. Does anybody want to remove anything or? Make a motion to approve consent items A through E. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, unanimous. And that was approved City Council minutes of January 4th, 2018. City Council's closed session meeting of January 4th, 2018. Approved City Council minutes January 16th. Approved Silver Spot Cooperative Nursery Preschool 15th Annual Luau Fundraiser event. And approved settlement agreement between uh, SFPP Kinder Morgan and the City of Brisbane concerning the application of the City's business license tax for storage facilities and approve the amendment for the lease of the City's Corporation Yard. Okay. That brings us to new business, which is item A, which is consider adoption of resolution number HA, which is for Housing Authority 2018-01, a resolution of the Brisbane Housing Authority of the City of Brisbane approving a sale of lots identified by County Assessor as parcel numbers 0075660107. 560130140 and 1202JL Homeland Development Group. Staff hey. report, please. Can I ask a question before we go on? Sure. Is that a typo on the parcel number? Doesn't look like it's enough digits on the second parcel number. Should be a zero. A zero. Or is it zero zero seven? It is zero zero seven. So those three seven seven. So those three parcel numbers are all changed. So zero zero seven five six zero one three zero one four zero one two zero. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Terry. Thank you. Okay. Staff report, please. Uh, Chair and members of the uh, Housing Authority. Uh, the Housing Authority owns a vacant property within the Brisbane Acres, totaling about 4.21 acres. Uh, this property was purchased by the, rede the Redevelopment Agency when it existed back in 2011 for just under $2 million. After the dissolution of the Redevelopment Agencies, 
the property was transferred to the Housing Authority. Recently, the authority has received an offer from JL Homeland Development Group to purchase the property. Housing Authority met in closed session uh, to discuss the terms and sale of uh, the terms of uh, the sale or purchase of this property, and provided direction to the executive director to negotiate with the uh, uh, with the buyer's broker, which has been accomplished. Uh, under the proposed uh, agreement. The sales price would be $2.732 million, which is substantially higher than the appraised value of the property. Uh, of that, 50000 would be uh, initial deposit, and $1.232 million would be paid at the close of escrow. The remaining $1 million would be, uh, would be a promissory note secured by a deed of trust on the property and would be paid as a balloon payment in May of 2021. The note would bear interest at 5%, and that would be paid, the interest and the principal would be paid in May of 2021. Uh, the buyer has a certain amount of time to undertake due diligence before moving ahead with the property. The city would provide whatever reports we have concerning the property to the buyer. Um, and Based on that, there would not be any commissions paid uh, by the housing authority to the purchaser. That will be an arrangement between the buyer and the broker. Uh, in light of that, uh, we have provided the purchase agreement, and as the council or as the authority has requested, we have also uh, sent this agreement to um, a real estate attorney, a law firm in San Francisco, to review it. Uh, I have some preliminary comments back from the, uh, the firm. It doesn't really change any of the deal points. Uh, those firm, those uh, comments, once I receive all of them, will be incorporated into the agreement. And uh, if accepted by the buyer, then we'll sign off on it, but not till uh, everyone has agreed to those particular terms. So with that uh, being said, be glad to answer any questions about the agreement or the resolution. Staff's recommendation is the resolution be adopted. Council questions? Anyone? No, I just wanted to go ahead, Terry. Um, thank staff for providing the date of 2011 um, because that was missing. It just said that we'd previously acquired it. So thank you for including that. Cliff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, in May of 2021, the, the, there would be a balloon payment of a million dollars. Um, and during the time that the transaction is closed, the, the buyer would be responsible with a 5% interest on, on that note. What potentially could happen if, you know, the, the buyer leaves the area and doesn't pay the million dollars? Then under the, uh, the, deed, the deed of trust provisions, the housing authority could do a what's called a non-judicial foreclosure, and essentially the housing authority uh, would be able to uh, recover that land uh, and therefore retain not only what the, uh, what the purchase price or what the, the down payments were, but then would also have the property back in its possession. So this, if that were to happen, the city would not uh, have to pay back the down payment Correct. What, 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 what happens as a practical matter is that it goes to uh, an auction, so to speak. So someone could technically come in and uh, offer the million plus the interest and buy the property. But that, if that did not happen, then essentially the city or, the, excuse me, the housing authority uh, buys the property for the unpaid amount and retains the property or re recovers the property. Okay. And then uh, based upon this uh, agreement, can the new owner of the property start developing the site prior to paying the uh, full amount? The, uh, the buyer could do that, but the uh, – the promissory note and deed of trust and this agreement provides that if any of the individual lots were sold off before the note is due, then the full amount is to be paid to the housing authority. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Karen? Um, that was my question. Okay. Yep. Madison? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. No, I just, uh, I wanted to make, I was going to ask about the real estate attorney reviewing it. So that, that was answered already. 
So, uh, you know, and I guess probably Stuart, this is you, maybe Michael, um, is the interest, is it compound interest or simple interest? Because it doesn't really specify. I believe it's simple. I think the agreement provides that it's simple interest. Simple, okay. Yeah. So it's just mm, be 5% yeah. of the 1 million over the course of three years. Okay. But do we have that written somewhere? It's in the it's in one of the documents in the one of the agreements. I remember reading that uh, somewhere in there. I can find it for you if you want to give me. Yeah, I was I was looking looking for that. I, I didn't. It skipped over it, but I never saw it. So okay. And it's five percent per year. Correct. Yeah. It's different. So in compound interest and simple interest. So. Okay. Very good. So uh, council's pleasure on this. I make a motion to approve. Um, no, I got to go to the Six, over here. Uh, resolution HA 2018 01. That's the way I read it. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Very good. Item B under new business consider adoption of resolution number 2018 06 amending the building permit fee schedule for non residential rooftop solar installations. And the purpose of this resolution is to establish the fee for non residential rooftop solar installations to $1,000 for systems up to 50 kilowatts plus 7 kilowatts, $7 uh, per kilowatt for each kilowatt between. 51 kilowatts and 250 kilowatts plus five dollars per kilowatt per kilowatt above 251 kilowatts. Do that ten times fast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Staff report. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. The city's adopted a fee schedule for building building permits. Um, CERT now calculates non-residential rooftop solar installation fees as a percentage of the value of the system being installed. So that's our current rules. Uh, this state legislation, AB 1414, took effect in January, established a maximum fixed uh, building permit fees that were outlined by the mayor. And so the purpose of the resolution is to bring the city's fee schedule into conformance with the requirements of state law. And we recommend adoption of resolution 2018-06. Okay. Council questions? I'll make a motion. I have none. A motion and a second? I'll second it. Oh, okay. Oh. I said I have no questions. Oh, okay. Well, that's a second. No, <laughs> it is now. No. Okay. Uh, Terry Madison, any questions? No. No. Okay. So we have no questions from council. So motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Very good. Item C under new business, which is consider introduction of ordinance 621. Waiving the first reading amending Title 10 of the Municipal Code concerning vehicles and traffic. Purpose of this ordinance is to revise the white line parking restrictions so that violation on lower streets is punishable by citation rather than towing. The ordinance will also create parking regulations for electric vehicle charging stations. There is no direct cost to the city as a result of implementing the recommended ordinance. A very small amount of income may be derived from the new parking citations. Staff report, please. Honorable Mayor, Member Tim, Council Members, good evening. So we are doing two things in here, as the Mayor just indicated. Let me take the second one first, if you don't mind, since it's, it seems to be perhaps the easiest one. We have a new publicly owned and maintained electric vehicle charging station in town. I, I know that many of you were at the opening ceremony earlier this week. Thank you for doing that. And what we are required to do so that we can enforce the use of that is to adopt by ordinance or resolution the fact that we're going to do that. So that's found in the, in the California Vehicle Code. So that's what, all we've done here is we've just implemented that into our municipal code where if there's a vehicle that's parked there and it's not in the process of charging or if it's obstructing access to the vehicle charging station, the police can go out there. And if it's, if it's all the way into the station, they can make a decision to either cite it or tow it. And if it's blocking access to it, they can make the decision to cite it. So that's all this is about. Um, the first one is the, the uh, somewhat notorious white line parking uh, limits that we have in town. Uh, many of you will recall that those were put into place shortly after the Oakland Hills fire. And as we indicate in the staff report, much of that 
came out of the after action report of the Hills fire where residents reported having an extremely difficult time getting out of the Oakland Hills and emergency services and fire equipment had a very difficult time getting in. They had very narrow streets. They had a lot of parking on the streets. So this ordinance was put into place uh, to try and fix that, to try and preserve uh, some access for emergency responders, notwithstanding the very narrow streets we have in the upper parts of central Brisbane. Over the years, the continued demand for on-street parking has forced the white line parking restrictions to creep lower and lower into central Brisbane. So uh, unfortunately, what that's left us with is we have an ordinance right now for the white line parking where the only recourse that the police department have is to tow a vehicle. But when that vehicle is on a lower street, say Alvarado or Klamath, although a vehicle might be in violation of the white line, it might actually be over the white line, there's still enough room for a vehicle to pass in the street. So it's not an immediate hazard. So it, it puts the, the officers, it puts the entire police department in a difficult situation of, so now we have 15 or 16 sworn officers out there trying to make individual decisions like, well, do I tow or do I cite this one? And, and if he's really not blocking traffic, is it reasonable to have somebody's car towed? Would it be reasonable to have your car towed if you're on a street like that? So the chief of police and I uh, talked about it, and we, we came together with this new proposal in here that we've got before you. And so this starts to do a couple of things. Number one, it defines what really is in violation of the white line. So it's, it's telling you that if your tire is over the line and there's space between the inside edge of that tire and the, out of the white slide, white, outside of the white line, you're in violation. So it's crystal clear because... Quite frankly, there are spots in town, because of the narrow amount of space we have, not all of the white line parking spaces are eight feet in width. So there are places where a vehicle can't fit fully in it and its tires rest on the white line. So we want to make it very clear so that, again, it's not a matter of 15 or 16 different officers trying to figure out what is or is not. I, I think it's almost like it was that football game not that long ago where the head referee took out a, a folded business card or something and stuck it between the football. Yeah, it was so lame. It was, yeah, it's... <laughs> Exactly. See, we don't want to have that to happen. We want it to be if it's if you could see daylight in there, then you're you're in violation. The other thing it does is it defines for us that there are streets where you are if you are in violation of the white line, then towing is a reasonable remedy for that. And that's be, that's typically the streets that are incredibly narrow, and they're listed both in the ordinance and in the staff report. But it's Trinity, it's Kings, it's Sierra Point, Humboldt, and Tulare. Those are the streets where if you're blocking that white line, you are literally blocking the traffic way and vehicles are not going to be able to get through. So, so that vehicle is a public safety hazard. It needs to be moved. The other thing it does, which I think is perhaps one of the most important things for us because it gives the police department another tool, <coughs> and I think it will help our citizens in the many complaints the police department gets, is that now when we have a vehicle that's on the lower streets and he's, block, and he's, and he's in violation of the white line policy, but he's not blocking that traffic has travel way, so it's not a really a hazardous situation. In that case, the officer now has a new tool where instead of saying, that's not really a towable offense, but now the officer, he or she, will be able to write a citation for that vehicle. So that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, the chief and I will be happy to take any questions you might have. Council questions? I have one. Uh, I got one, too. So You got one? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Terry. Um, it, it's not really in regards to this ordinance, but... How many vehicles have we towed for being in violation of the upper street white line in recent history? I would say we had four total. Four total over the years? Over the years. I would say in the last 20 years. Okay. Because generally what we do, if we do see a violation, we'll go out and before we would tow, we would go and contact the register, the owner of the vehicle and get them to comply before we would actually call a tow truck up there to not only block the roadway, but to also so that the resident wouldn't incur another fee. Right. I, I assumed it was a fairly low number because we haven't heard about it particularly. Um, and have they... Um, come up with what the um, fee would be for the citations? Yes. Um, as, as a matter of fact, we have a new parking fee schedule that will be coming to before council at the next regular council meeting, but the number we came up with was $40. Okay. So it's a, a fairly reasonable fee, and, and does the officer have a uh, – will they have a um, – ability to still contact that uh, resident if necessary prior to issuing that or is that going to be 
a direction given for while we're starting the enforcement of this? Well, they certainly can go out and contact the uh, registered owner of the vehicle as well. I mean, generally we do a lot of, you know, it's part of our community-oriented policing mission is to, to make contact with owners and try to get them to comply. And then that way, the next time it's in our computer system, then they would get cited. Okay, because I, I just think it's going to be a, you know, a learning curve for some of our residents to, to realize that they need to be over it and that we're going to be enforcing it a little more strictly. So, And what I, I'd I like to also stress is that we will do some type of educational, um, because this is, the, is a change to our ordinance, we will make a point of doing it, getting some information out of social media as well as putting something in the star. So there would be a, a phase where we can, a period where we can go out and educate the, um, the residents of the change. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Madison? Mm -hmm. I don't have any questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, you know, when, when I was out campaigning this past election, I, I didn't get any feedback in regards to cars not parked, you know, inside the white lines. It was more the cars that were parked inside the white lines yeah. or the garbage cans that are inside the, um, the white lines. And, um, I, I'm going to get to that in a little bit, but uh, uh, if someone's parked in their driveway and they're sticking out um, over the white line, they would then be in violation of, of this. Yes, technically, yes, they would. And we would encourage them to move up as far as they could up to their driveway. Generally, it's they could make it work. A lot of times people don't realize how much space they still have at the front, but if it's brought to their attention, they, okay. they would be, yes, they would be in violation. All right, all right. Um, yeah, you know, in regards to, you know, the, just the parking within the white lines, um, and, and, and I'll admit I, I've been at fault, <laughs> you know, for that. I mean, because, you know, unless someone complains, you typically, you know, can leave your vehicle out there. Um, and then you get the red tag, and then, okay, I, I better move. Um, but, uh, you know, during uh, the recent office hours that I've had, people were complaining about that, that there isn't enough parking because people either, they, they, they leave their cars out there or other people are parking inside the white lines, uh, but also just leaving garbage cans uh, there. So... Um, what what other remedies besides making the phone call do you think that the, our, our police um, force can do to get those cars to move? Generally, we've always been enforcement. We've done enforcement only generally by complaint driven. I mean, in the past years, council has always been supportive of it not going out and do heavy heavy parking enforcement, but more you know by complaint driven, and that's how we've always kind of established unless of course you have in this case areas up in the street where you have where it's more of a hazard it could be a safety issue in regards to ingress or egress of traffic so certainly those are those kinds of violations we would immediately address but you know the like the garbage cans there is an ordinance that says you can take your garbage cans the night before service and then once it's picked up that next day you should be able, you should pull them away we don't generally do it if officers see it out during the day because many of the residents don't get home until the evening to be able to pull their garbage cans and, and put them back away. So, yes, if there is any concerns that we encourage the residents to give us a call, we, we have code enforcement who can follow up by sending or contacting the owners and advising them of the ordinance. Many, many times residents don't know that there is such ordinances in place. Uh, okay. So if, um, if, if police officers saw a group of garbage cans you know, on a Monday or Tuesday or week after week, um, they would only try and reach out to that homeowner if someone made the call. Obviously, you know, it's, it's just, they just leave them there for convenience or maybe they just don't want anyone parking near their home. So, If officers were to see it continuously, I'm sure that the officers would contact them or notify code enforcement to uh, send a letter to them advising them of the ordinance. Okay, thank you. Yes. Karen? Mm -hmm. um, some of the parking spots on Tulare are not really wide enough for a car. So are you going to paint over those white lines? Because there's 
probably three parking spots that I know of that are really not wide enough that any car that's parked, unless they're parked up on the curb, they're, they're on or across the white line. I'm thinking of the space right opposite my house to the left, There's, unless you've got a car that's about this wide. So what are we doing about those spaces? Nothing. I mean, you're correct. that Some of those spaces are so narrow that to utilize them, you're going to have to park on the curb. And that's a function of the minimum amount of space that we need left in the travelway for a fire engine just to drive down there. So I can't, okay. I can't make the road any wider. But uh, we, we put the lo white lines in many cases in that space just because when we went back and looked at what the historical pattern was, people were parked up on the curb. And that's yeah. how they were accommodating it. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Randy, I, I know of... One one situation though, where where like what Karen's talking about, and I know that it, it it's I'm familiar with Tulare and know that it's only a certain width is some most of the streets in Brisbane actually, but there's one particular spot. Um, it's on Humboldt in Placer, right there by Costanos Canyon, and what happens is, is the curb. It's kind of kicked out, and then it goes in like this. But the line that was drawn was in a uniform kind of line that you know had uh, the curve of the curve, so to speak. Uh, but there's ample space there to kind of move it out eight to twelve inches to where a car could park there. Because technically, I mean, they, cars park there all the time, but right now it's not wide enough. But it would be wide enough by moving out a little bit and it would still fit within our ordinance and that's something uh, I'd like to take a look at if I and I'll, I'll I could you know sh certainly go out there with you and show it and take measurements but I know for a fact that you know I mean the goal is not to eliminate parking spots and the goal is not to give out tickets it's just to be able to enforce things I think that it's the discretion of the officer right Lisa is, is and, and in this case is like it doesn't make sense because it, it, we're eliminating really what would be a viable parking spot just due to the contour of a toe versus the, how the line is drawn, you know. And, and, and to me, that's the only case scenario that I know of. But, you know, I don't want to see that parking spot eliminated because of our ordinance or a person getting a ticket all the time or something. You, you know what I mean? That uh, I, I understand your concern completely. Yeah, I'm happy yeah. to look at those individual situations in the field. I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and if it could, I, I would certainly go out there with you and just uh, take a gander. I know you're on vacation right now, aren't you, or somewhere? Technically, I'm on vacation, sir, but apparently I have deep trouble with the meaning of that word. Yeah, well, I'm glad you came. <laughs> hence, you, hence the no tie. I thought I dressed where'd, where'd down. Where'd you go? On <laughs> so, yeah, maybe next week or something, uh, you and I could take a look at that. Sure. And, and uh, um, maybe look at doing this, uh, a correction of some sort, or, you know, your your evaluation anyway. Okay, is that any other council questions? No. Nope. All right, council's pleasure. I'd make a motion to um, introduce ordinance 621. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Nope. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we're done with that. Brings us to staff report, city manager's report on upcoming activities. No reports. Nothing? Nothing? Nothing at all? What do, uh, don't we have, um, oh yeah, we're, we're hosting uh, Council of Cities dinner on the 20. Why not? Yeah, we're hosting a Council of Cities <laughs> dinner next Friday night at uh, By Right. Yeah. Not this Friday, next Friday. Correct. The 23rd, right? 23rd. 23rd. Okay. All right, brings us to Mayor Council Matters, um, countywide assignments and subcommittee reports. Any? I have Anybody? none. I was on vacation. Yay. <laughs> well, I got a few. Uh, you want to talk about them? Yeah. Oh, I've, we have time. but No, no, okay. I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm only going to talk about half. I'm going to spare you. I think we got plenty of time. So, so I did fill in for Terry at the roundtable, SFO roundtable, and I filled in for Cliff at CCAG. Unfortunately, I took some stellar notes and then left them at home. So I really want to make sure that I do a, a good job and, and let you guys know exactly what happened. So I'm going to hold off on reporting on those until next meeting 
In the meantime, uh, Cliff and I did have an economic development subcommittee meeting. Um, we met with staff and Mitch, and Mitch basically just gave us a heads up of everything economic development related, a lot of different businesses that he's working with. Um, the theme is either, you know, uh, is typically that he's got like uh, 11,000 square foot and maybe like a 60 and an 80 or something like that. So mostly um, there are a lot of businesses wanting to come in, but not necessarily a space that is a perfect fit. There are a lot of businesses that are looking for smaller units that we just don't have. Um, seem to be getting a really big interest from cannabis-related businesses. Um, so it seems like Cannabox is finally, you know, they got a space and they're working towards getting everything set up. Um, but there are quite a few other businesses that are interested as well. Um, but again, you know, finding a space that kind of fits their size needs has been the challenge. Um, there's been, I think a new biotech company that's going to be coming in down at, um, Sierra point, which is really exciting. So we're talking about, um, the, the main concern with them is that they are, may not necessarily, uh, be able to fulfill the parking requirements as written. And, um, we're looking at, we're, we're kind of suggesting maybe the Sierra point, subcommittee might take a look at some of those parking requirements because they might be a little bit outdated and we want to make sure that we can accommodate really great businesses like that who utilize shuttles and um, public transportation and stuff to get to get their uh, workers to work and it's sort of a different model where a lot of times in the biotech industry people are there 24 hours a day instead of having all of their employees there at one time um, so they may not um, necessarily need as much parking as what is written right now that they need. So uh, I don't know if you want to elaborate. I'm trying I, to really to do a really good no, job. You, you did an awesome job of, <laughs> of just saying what uh, what we discussed during that meeting. Yeah, it was great. It was, it was Madison and I's first uh, economic development right. subcommittee meeting together. And, um, uh, you know, you talked about Sierra Point. I mean, there's a lot of stuff happening at yeah. zero point right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, HCP is building two buildings. Uh, they're doing some test pilings right now. Um, and then uh, there's a, 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 a tenant who's moving into the, uh, the old Dakin building. It's going to be an 11 year lease, I believe. So I mean, it's yeah. long term commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to do um, some additional remodeling inside uh, the atrium area who are they it's a biotech firm from richmond, richmond. i forget what they're called you remember uh, san jamo hmm. s-a-n-g-a-m-o yeah. it's their corporate san headquarters san jamo right? it will it will be their corporate headquarters that's why they're doing 11 year lease and they're wanting to put in a, like um an exhibit on the first floor when you come in in the atrium so that like people can come in and learn about the biotech industry which I thought was really cool. It might be a nice place to like take, take go for a, a brief field trip, you know, for the for Silver Spot or you know elementary school or middle school. Mm -hmm. So just so like a really cool place in town that could hopefully stimulate learning. Yes. Interesting. Uh, we also Frito Lay has expressed interest in just being more involved in the community. Um, they want, I think, sink their partner with the city to sink their teeth into a project regarding sustainability, maybe something with trails, just, uh, be a little bit more involved in the community. And so, um, we're going to try and figure out a way where we can partner with them. And Cliff and I, I think are going to maybe take a couple Born field trip trips. They, they've been here a long <laughs> time, right? Yeah. Really, really long yeah, time. They've been here for a really long time. 30, 30 something years. 30 something years. Wow. So longer than Madison's been around. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, always rubbing it in. Up already, he's uh, rubbing it in. Hey, it's a good thing. <laughs> You'll be around a lot longer than I am. That's for sure. Um, nice, you get to see all the all the low hanging fruit come to fruition. Yeah, but there will be. It'll, I'll, my shoe will be on that foot at some point where I'll I'll be saying, oh. 
<laughs> Look at all these things I'm not going to see get done. Yeah. You know? Yeah, when Laffy, uh, you yeah, know, Yeah, when Laffy's here. And... Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um... Yeah, Broadway. <laughs> right. I also had a meeting with Canapa, but I don't want to move on to that unless you had anything else you wanted to contribute to. No, the... you did a very thorough job. Okay, you know. perfect. Thank you. So I met with Canapa. That was great. Um, I didn't really know in the beginning why he wanted to meet, but he let me know that um, I think they have some countywide funds that are to be spent on construction projects. He wanted to meet and see if there was anything that we had going on that we could use some money for. I'm like, sure. So um, he, I brought up... Yeah, so I brought up a couple of different uh, projects. We talked about the library... Um, we also talked about the teen center site and, um, you know, potential workforce housing development that we've been talking about, um, in the affordable housing subcommittee. And I could tell none of those things were really like striking him the way that I wanted it to. He wasn't getting, he was kind of like, you know, and so then I mentioned, um, the portable over at BES uh, because he had told me in the beginning that he had spent already some of the construction funds on an after-school program in South City, and he seemed to, like, really be excited mm -hmm. about that. And so I just brought up that, you know, we ourselves have our own after-school problem and that we really need a new construction for, and we could use some money for that and just kind of explain the whole situation where we have kids on the waiting list that we can't accept because our program cannot accommodate, our building cannot accommodate uh, the necessary kids that want to be involved, and the kids we do have can't also fit in there, so half of them usually have to be outside. So he felt really compelled to get involved, and he seemed really motivated to work with us and even suggested the county throwing out half of the money that would be needed for purchasing that portable, which would be around $50,000. So um, it was just, you know, a preliminary conversation. Um, I had told him that I'd have Clay send over more information for him to mull over, but he seemed really interested. So that could be a great way for us to build that out. And then some of that money that we might have spent could go into enrichment activities like, you know, watercolor class or um, instrument making class like we've been discussing, or, you know, it could also be funneled maybe into another program somewhere else. But if we can get money, we want to get money. So I'm hoping that maybe if he asks to sit down with you, you guys will bring up that project as well. So we can hopefully have some reinforcement and, and, and get that happening. So that's it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'll, I'll be uh, talking with Supervisor Canapa tomorrow. Okay. So. Um, Me too. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. So thanks for the heads up. No problem. So if I could just follow up on, because oh. um, Madison did talk to me about the, the, the modulars. So um, these are Measure K funds that he, he is talking about. So we're in contact with their staff. Uh, there's an actual application process, um, so we will be filling out the application and, and submitting that. And I'll keep you informed on um, on what we submit and um, also the process. With those Measure K funds, Clay, uh, each supervisor gets a certain portion, and they that's historically do, how they've handled it. Do with um, it as they see right. see fit. It, it was measure called Measure A at the time, but that's mm -hmm. how we got the three hundred thousand for the library. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I will be seeing David tomorrow at 9.30 at Madhouse. Oh, perfect. Just we also, we talked about a lot of other things. We talked about the school bus issue. I did bring up if there was a way that, because at our uh, Jefferson Union High School board meeting, high school district board meeting, they kind of mentioned that this was a Canapa jurisdiction and that parents should contact him. So I had asked him, you know, did anyone contact you about the school bus? And he was like, no. Mm. So we talked about it a little bit, and he made it pretty clear that that's n that's not in his jurisdiction. So <laughs> I did try and broach that topic with him, um, but it, it it didn't really go anywhere, and it, it's not because he had a lack of interest. I just think it's really not something that he can help us figure out, but I tried. Mm. Um, and we... You know, we talked about a couple of other things, but he seems really intent on trying to make sure that he forges a really close relationship with Brisbane and us and gets involved in 
helping us as our representative. And so I also thanked him for his article in the Chronicle in support of us in our own self-determination with regards to the Baylands. And he appreciated that I acknowledged him for his efforts. And he did tell me that he met with somebody pretty high up at Lyft who gave him a really hard time about saying that. And so it sounds like he's taken some heat from the tech tech people, but he said he stands by what he says and he's here to be our support and our ally. So that felt great. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm really done. <laughs> um, I had a very exciting first meeting in JPA for the um, San Mateo County libraries, but they were discussing um, something they'd been working on for four years. So 100% of it went straight over my head. <laughs> um, I do believe I'll be having another meeting with them shortly to really get into the, the nitty-gritty of what they're doing, countywide, library. That sounded like there's some interesting things going on, but it was just so deep and so intense, I had no clue where they were coming from. So. Was it about donor funds? Uh, donor funds and a few other programs they're thinking about, but there were, there was it was a very intense agenda with a few very intense people commenting on the agenda. So I just... Yes, if it's... If it's donor funds, it, it has been going on since I sat on that board uh, the first year that I was on the council. For, for six years, they have been intensely debating the donor funds issue. Well, this was the culmination of that, so <coughs> yeah, my that, input was just being there. Yeah, it actually, we d have negotiated an agreement, and that will be coming to the council as part of a JPA amendment on March 15th. Cool. And it will benefit the system. Good. Thank you. Any other countywide assignments, subcommittee reports? Yeah, I had a commute.org meeting this morning. Um, one of the cool things that came out of that meeting was um, how uh, commuters can can uh, get get tied into, um, I guess, their apps. You know, so like if you're a bicyclist. Or, or cyclist and a, or a runner, you can sign up for this um, with this company called Strava. And what Strava does is they um, they will uh, chart your route that you take. Um, they'll record your time, and and, and it's very competitive. Um, so what they're they want to do is use that same type of platform for uh, commuters. And so, you know, people who take carpools or the bus or the train. And so then they can, they can log that route that the person has taken. And then they can log how many miles they, they did that day and how, how many that week and then a month. And, and so this is real data. You know, unlike, you know, you go out and you do a survey and try and collect that information. And, and, and here you have real data. Now... Um, I mean, it means, of course, you're being tracked, <laughs> you know, what you're doing. But, you know, uh, a lot of people um, like to be competitive with these types of things. And so it's like, uh, you know, if one of the things that, that commute.org likes to do is provide prizes. And uh, one of the prizes that they had, and I tried it out this morning, was this electric scooter. So uh, Jeff G might it might be on his Facebook thing you know, later today. So I got on that thing, and oh boy, it was a blast. You know, it's was, it's was, it got a lot of a lot of get up and go. But anyways, so um, but yeah, no. So it's it's a really great um, you know app for commuters uh, to use, and and um, you know they'll provide prizes for a certain amount of of um, you know miles or. Um, how many times they use it. So, yeah. There we go. That, that was pretty much it. <laughs> it you know, the only thing I had was a ribbon cutting yesterday for the new uh, uh, quick charge uh, vehicle station over in the shopping center. And uh, Karen was there, of course, staff and uh, a lot of uh, electric car enthusiasts. And uh, not only did we cut a ribbon, but we cut a gas, co gas hose in half. So... Oh, fun. Uh, yeah. And then uh, we had uh, um, a gentleman from the California State uh, Energy Commission, uh, Sven, uh, uh, Sven uh, I forget his last name, uh, 
uh, anyway, he had his electric car there. The guy was really passionate about it, so I, I took it for a ride. <laughs> you know, just uh, to, to, and we had a, a local citizen, um, um, Luke uh, Deschamps, who brought his car down there for a demonstration okay. on uh, doing the, the fill-up on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I plugged it in for him, so... Uh, it's pretty cool, pretty cool. So I think folks with electric cars are going to have something, and uh, it's going to be certainly a wave of the future. Um, planning on adding a little blurb in that on the um, um, mayor's column for the Chamber of Commerce this, this month of February. So well, I can um, probably give you a little bit of information on the the charging costs. We we actually put a charger on the house, and um, the cost to recharge the car is is totally minimal. So yeah, um, it was a, a good investment. Did you ride in the Bolt yet? I I did. So Zero to I, I drove I Tesla? drove uh, I drove one of them yesterday. I drove oh, a, um, crazy Finn's car. So, um, but one of the things he you know was kind of uh, saying, well, the next thing we'll have Adrian work on. A Adrian Etheridge, our uh, uh, um, what was it? What is Adrian? Sustainability something. Yeah, okay. She's, uh, uh, is to work on doing a ordinance for new uh, new construction to pre-wire for that. It says which the cost would be a lot cheaper because, you know, it comes in when you have to put it in that the installation is much more expensive. But the right. pre, you know, to just kind of stub out for it where it's not, you know, put into houses, but it's stubbed out for it. And uh, so... Uh, well, at least make um, the public aware that if they're thinking of doing any kind of upgrade, it's like when we upgraded our kitchen, putting in um, a new power source, they said, oh, you only need an X panel. And I said, well, what about electric charges and all these things that are coming you know in the future so for literally five hundred dollars more we got a top of the line panel that took the electric charger absolutely no problem oh, so yeah. just just making people aware don't throw you know don't throw bad money out when if you're thinking of maybe an electric car in three years you have to replace that and those panels are super expensive <laughs> are you laughing at me <laughs> Maybe. Okay, <laughs> laughing with you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, uh, speaking of electric vehicles, so uh, Samtrans is going to be phasing out their diesel buses, and they've purchased some electric buses. Nice. Love uh, it. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, that's the direction things are moving in, and uh, it has to be <coughs> uh, global you. climate change. Bless you, Madison. Okay, any more reports? Not... Seeing any hands, no takers. Um, brings item C, which is uh, City Council meeting schedule and scheduling of a public employee performance evaluation of city manager on April 5th, 2018. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah, just before, April right before 5th, the meeting. It says, oh, you want to do city manager's um, evaluation. Beforehand, before that meeting? Yeah, yeah, closed session. That's yeah. fine. 6.30. Yeah. Or 725, I don't know, whatever you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> now that's something to laugh about. Okay. <laughs> that's better. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, but that, does, that meeting does not include a, um, that still has the contract. We, we aren't renegotiating a contract on that, are we? You mean with me? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure. Not okay. unless you want to. <laughs> no, no, no. I thought that we were. I, uh, yeah, no, no. I, I'm, I'm in not. In past supposed... years, we, we do that, but th we were on a two-year cycle, so. Yeah, no. I just wanted um, to make sure. I have. Yeah. That, Time-wise. That, that's not the. Um, I, I, I know what you're saying. That that would not be part of this. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and we do have a, a pack schedule for uh, March. All right. We do. That's it oh for that. Oh, my gosh. Written communications. Uh, yep. We have one. From an unidentified person. From SW. I don't like it when that happens. That, that's Hard nice. to take it seriously when Can they have don't find one? their name. Well, say who you are. Written communications? Or was that to you? 
Oh, from I think, SH. I I, I I think that was to me. Well, it was to you originally. I think the the subsequent the follow up was. To me. Yeah. It ended with things that we can't discuss uh, due to certain wording that was probably deemed unacceptable. Oh my God, did I miss part of it? I uh -huh. I must have missed it. Uh. I'll, I'll I'll tell you privately. It, okay. it, it was. It's not for public consumption. Yeah. I can't wait. Some, yes. some may like it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I had a good chuckle over it. I did too. I can't Doesn't wait. Defend to me. <laughs> Okay, um, with that, oral communications number two, and we got a clear house right now, so uh, we're going to adjourn in memory of the victims of the South Florida High School where the shooting tragedy took place. With that, meeting adjourned. All right. Thank you.